Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Tata Alexi's Q4 and annual audited financial results for FY24 conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Shashank Ganesh from EY. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to all the participants in the call. Good morning for joining us from the Western side. Before we proceed to the call, let me remind you that the discussion may contain forward-looking statements uh, that may involve known or unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors. Therefore, it must be viewed in conjunction with the business risk that could cause further result performance or achievements that differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. To take us through the results and answer your questions today, we have the Senior Management of Tata Alexi, represented by Mr. Manoj Raghavan, Managing Director and CEO, Mr. Nitin Pai, Chief Marketing and Chief Strategy Officer, Mr. Gaurav Bajaj, Chief Financial Officer, and Ms. Kaveri Sriram, Company Secretary. We will start the call with a brief overview of the past quarter by Mr. Raghavan, followed by a Q&A session. Uh, we'd appreciate your cooperation in restricting yourself to two questions to allow participants an opportunity to interact. If you have any further questions, you may join the queue, and we'd be happy to respond to them or sign on them. With that, I'd like to hand over the call to Mr. Manoj Raghavan. Over to you, Manoj. Thank you, Shashank. Uh, good day to all of you joining us for the earnings call for the fourth quarter and for the full financial year 23-24. Uh, FI24 has been a year of consistent operational performance with a revenue growth of 13% despite the global macroeconomic uncertainties and volatility in the media and communication industry over the last few quarters. We have done well to maintain industry-leading EBITDA margins at 29.5% for the year, even while we continue to invest in expanding our talent base through all the four quarters, with a net addition of 1,535 elections through the year. Now, I come to a summary of the financial performance in FI24. Our revenue from operations were at rupees 355, sorry, 3,552 crore, uh, a year on year growth of 13%, EBITDA margin at 29.5%, PBT margin at 28.5%, uh, profit before tax grew 11.9% to 1,048.7 crore. And actually, this is the first uh, full year, uh, first time our full year PBT crosses rupees 1,000 crores. Uh, coming to the summary of the financial performance in Q4 of FI24, our revenue from operations uh, came in at rupees 905.9 crores, a, a degrowth of 0.9% quarter on quarter, and a growth of 8.1% Y on Y. And uh, the operating revenue growth, uh, actually on constant currency basis, was uh, had a degrowth of 0.6% quarter on quarter and 7.2% uh, growth y, uh, YOY. EBITDA margin was at, came in at 28.8% and the PPT margin at 27.9%. The board of directors have recommended a final dividend of 700%, that is uh, rupees 70 per equity share of uh, power value of rupees 10 each uh, for the financial year ending March 31st, 2024, subject to the approvals by the shareholders of the company at the AGM. We had laid down a strategy of, uh, you know, integrating our design business deeply with our key industry verticals, complementing our software and digital business with a design-led proposition. This is now complete with a seamless end-to-end -end proposition from ideation to market introductions. This is enhancing our competitive differentiation, providing early visibility into customer product roadmaps, and creating larger downstream development deals. Over 90% of our industrial design and visualization revenues are now directed to customers in our three main verticals. Uh, while the remaining, uh, remaining uh, comprises of innovation and design-led projects in other industries, including consumer packaged goods, retail, energy and utilities, manufacturing, adding diversity to the application of digital design and feeding possibilities for future verticals for the company. This has been classified as others in the segment report. Starting with this quarter, 
We are reporting this integrated view of our industrial design and visualization business in all three verticals and not standalone. So our software development services, SDS, combines the erstwhile EPD revenues and IDV revenues into the respective verticals as one segment with a system integration and support constituting the other segment. Now let me provide a summary of the key industry verticals and segments to the company. If you look at our transportation business during the financial year, a transportation business grew strongly at 20.5% year on year in constant currency terms, and now accounts for almost 50% of our overall SDS revenues. And out of this, uh, the work that we do for OEMs constitute over 56% of our overall transportation business, and we're now embedded into the SDB programs of five global OEMs. This business grew at 1.2% quarter on quarter in constant currency terms, despite delays in the planned scaling of uh, SDB large deal that we have awarded, we have been awarded previously. I'm especially delighted with the German Design Award 2024 for our work on automotive HMI which underscores the design-led profession that we are now delivering to customers globally. We were selected into the SDV program of another global OEM and are ramping up teams to support infotainment, ADAS, and EV software tracks over the next few quarters. The quarter also saw a digital deal, a digital technology-led deal in the rail segment for development of an advanced collision detection and warning system for a rail operator in North America this leverages advanced sensor technologies and AI to provide an early warning system. Coming to our healthcare and life sciences business, uh, this business registered a growth of 7.6% by on my in constant currency terms in a financial year. Uh, we have established a strong foundation for continued growth with uh, addition of five market customer logos in the year and expanded capabilities and platforms in new growth areas such as digital therapeutics and connected health. The Auto Development Center for Innovation and R&D we announced in March 2024 for Drago Medical, the German headquartered leader in critical care and safety equipment, demonstrates the relevance of a technology and design expertise and deep domain capabilities for next generation healthcare. We are investing and winning deals with GenAI-led solutions for the healthcare industry including identification and elimination of toxic materials from the medical device supply chain. We are building platforms and winning deals for digital therapeutics, an emerging and strongly growing team for the healthcare of tomorrow. Coming to the media and communication business, this business declined 2.6% in constant currency terms during the financial year. This quarter saw a merger-led impact of a deal ramp down with one customer, However, considering the severity of challenges in the media and telecom industry, we have done well throughout the year to protect business, add marquee customers, and increase wallet share with key customers. We are seeing growth in operator revenues and our overall customer base. Even as customers continue to tighten budgets and optimize spend, we believe that there are opportunities in contributing to the revenues through advertising technologies or ad tech and enabling OPEX reductions to automation and transformation of network operations. We are actively investing in offerings, platforms, and partnerships for both areas. Both leverage AI and Gen AI to deliver speed and autonomous operations. We are delighted with Neuron, Catalyxis Network Transformation and Automation Suit, being declared the platinum winner of, of the Juniper Awards for Telco Transformation. It was also the center stage of our showcase at the Mobile World Conference in Barcelona in February. The power of a design-led proposition is best underscored with a multi-million uh, US dollar program we won late in this quarter for the customer experience transformation of video services of a leading Africa plus Middle East operator operating in over 25 countries. This also demonstrates new opportunities for us in new markets such as LATAM, Middle East, and Africa. Coming to our system integration and support business, we continue to pivot to value added services innovation-led projects such as experience centers, and supporting downstream deployment and run management of our products and platforms. Q4 revenues and growth was impacted by hardware shipment delays uh, due to the Red Sea uh, shipping crisis, which did not allow us to deliver and build some revenues, 
Despite this, it grew credit, credibly by 18.6% in, in the financial year 24 in cost and currency terms, um, getting close to a 100 crore business in this financial year. From a customer standpoint, we are transforming our customer base across industries with a significant shift towards OEMs in the automotive industry and operators in the media and telecom industry. While we continue to invest in deepening our key customer relationships, this is reflected in a strong growth in our top 10 and top 25 customers across the company. From a talent perspective, we continue to invest ahead of time in building a talent pipeline. We are expanding our presence across locations in India and overseas. Our employee retention continues to be the best among our peers and industry at large at 12.4%. We continued, uh, we added 178 elections net uh, uh, additions in the fourth quarter and 1,535 elections in the full year. And we have a planned intake of fresh engineers and laterals through FI25. On the AI and Gen AI front, we continue to invest strongly in solutions, uh, POCs and projects, uh, and ramp up of talent across the company. We have created and deployed specialized programs to be able to get 25% uh, uh, of our engineers AI ready by Q3 of FI25. We are working on experimenting and innovating using Gen AI across design and software. We are targeting areas that may be impacted by Gen AI and disrupt our business, such as coding, automated testing, uh, that we proactively take to customers. Equally, we are applying Gen AI to workflows and processes, regulatory work, automation of network operations as a new service, frameworks and solutions we can take to customers to customers. The large deal that we announced in the healthcare regulatory space already uses automation and AI to deliver efficiency, speed, and higher quality to workflows for our customers. We are also enriching our in-house platforms such as Neuron, ICX, PCAR, with Gen AI to enable new use cases and customer experiences for our customers. Uh, in the quarter, we also hosted a Gen AI hackathon internally for our employees with over 76 teams participating across our industry segments. Even as we step into the new financial year, uh, we are pleased to announce two new members to the board. Mr. Saumitra Bhattacharya has had an illustrious corporate career, especially in the automotive industry, with over 28 years with Bosch Group. He serves as the chairman of Bosch Limited and is a director for ISQM, an industry-led initiative focused on quality, excellence, and innovation. Uh, Mrs. Ashu Suyash is a highly respected leader and served as an MD and CEO of Crystal among leadership roles across many leading institutions. He has recently set up Colossa Ventures, an investment ecosystem for women entrepreneurs, and is an independent director on a few boards, including Uni Hindustan Unilever. We look forward to leveraging the rich experience and network, industry knowledge, and strategic inputs from our new directors. In summary, I'm, I'm pleased with our overall performance and resilience in revenues, margins, and customer additions throughout the year in a volatile macroeconomic environment. We are entering the new financial year with a commitment for growth and a continued confidence in our differentiated and integrated design digital capabilities. This is backed by strategic relationships we have built over years with key customers, the qualitative change in revenues towards OEMs and SDB programs, entries into new operators and marquee healthcare logos, investments in talents and hiring that we have made and continue to make, investments in strategic technology areas and AI, and a strong deal pipeline we carry into the new financial year. Thank you, and we can open the, uh, open the floor for q and Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Bhavik Mehta from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, first thing on the media line, can you just give more color in terms of whether it was in the media vertical or in the telecom space. And uh, if, if you can quantify the ramp down as well, 
uh, for the quarter and so is this something which is completely done or should we expect some further ramp downs in, in the coming quarter as well and the second question is on margin so uh, we saw margins decline by more than 100 basis points this year so how should we think about margins for next year given that the demand environment has not changed uh, so are you targeting to maintain margins or do you have some levers where we can see the margin expansion thank you yeah, so I think uh, the, uh, the the dip that we had with Panakand was in the um, uh, the media operator uh, segment. Uh, it impacted uh, almost three uh, percent. That uh, one single uh, you know uh, uh, degrowth that we've had with uh, one customer. Uh, coming to the margins, uh, um, I think we are pretty confident with the sort of uh, uh, pipeline that we have. Uh, and uh, you know the levers that we have to uh, you know manage our margins so we are definitely looking back to to come back to the margins uh, for the full year um, that we delivered uh, in the last financial year um, so so i think that is what we would focus on yeah just to add uh, bhavik uh, we are done with uh, the ramp down so that doesn't continue or decline further Okay, just a clarification. This is three percent impact is for the quarter at overall level, right? No, at, at the, the MCV level. At the MCV level. Yeah, so medium communications, if you note, uh, they grew just a little more than four percent for the quarter, out of which about three percent was attributable to the single uh, customer and the single ramp down. We are done with that this quarter. So when we start the next quarter, we have no further impact from that customer. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, otherwise, we would have ended up just about neutral. So that's the point. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sulab Govilla from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so my uh, first question is on the transportation business. Uh, so just wanted to understand that um, uh, there are multiple moving parts in the sense that on the one hand, we have um, OEM related business uh, where we see uh, SDV projects, um, uh, you know, coming in. And, um, uh, and then at the same time, there is a, um, uh, you know, delay in, in the form of, um, you know, ramp up of some of these projects. And uh, also uh, X of OEMs, uh, some of the tier one business could be coming off. So, so just wanted to understand that, um, um, right now, the sort of growth that we've posted, which is 1.2% Q on Q, uh, when can we think about uh, this accelerating, given that, uh, you know, there are multiple moving parts there? Um, yeah, it is, uh, you know, um, as, you write, as we rightly, you know, talked about, uh, currently 56% of our business comes from OEM. So if you look at it in, a, in, the, in the previous financial year, I think our uh, tier one business was more like 50% and OEM business was more like 40%. I think you've done exceedingly well to, uh, you know, transition transition this into a lot more focused on the uh, OEM business and the sort of deals that they've been winning. Yes, there have been some delays in uh, in in one deal that uh, we have won, uh, but uh, we definitely see uh, that uh, ramp up picking up uh, towards the later half of uh, this quarter. So um, so I think uh, um, our focus is to continue to exploit. The opportunities that we see in the, in the OEM business, tier ones, uh, you know, uh, we we used to have a large portfolio of tier ones. So what we're really focusing is to really focus on select key uh, tier ones that we believe will continue to grow strongly. And in all the in in these tier one, uh, you know, businesses, we are looking at consolidation uh, opportunities. So we are not abandoning the tier one business because we still believe that there is opportunities there and there are a lot of consolidation opportunities that we are bidding for at this point in time so that is something we will strongly focus on and and we hope that uh, the delays and uh, you know uh, the issues that we are seeing in the industry over the, over the next you know this quarter we will we will we will see that uh, coming to a close and we'll hopefully be able to ramp up on all the deals uh, because we have uh, we have done all uh, the necessary work that is needed for preparation uh, we have the pipeline uh, available, um, uh, so so it is it is a question of um, you know uh, ensuring that uh, we 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 ramp up and uh, the customer uh, decisions are are taken and we move forward. Okay, understood. 
Understood. And um, uh, my second question was on, on the the media vertical. Uh, so I just wanted to understand that um, uh, while you mentioned that this particular ramp down is now over, and um, uh, you also see uh, you know some of the opportunities in in other parts of uh, this vertical. So just wanted to understand that from a overall outlook for this vertical in the coming quarters. Um, versus versus what we've seen, uh, you know, overall in the last year, which is sort of a decline for the full year. So, so should we expect in the coming quarters uh, an improvement in the outlook for this vertical, given, uh, you know, what you see today? Uh, we believe that we have bottomed out uh, in Q4 uh, for this vertical. We have, uh, of course, taken, we have, uh, you know, internally we have done uh, some amount of restructuring in the way we go. Uh, to market uh, in, in this particular vertical, we made some strategic choices. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, you know we will see uh, uh, you know growth coming back into this vertical, you know, as we move into the you know Q1 and Q2 of uh, this financial year. So, um, so we have, the pipeline is building up, uh, and uh, I'm pretty bullish that uh, we will see a recovery. Understood. Understood. Thanks for taking my question. I'll get back in the queue. In the queue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vimal Jamnadas Goel from Alchemy Capital Management Private Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, so two questions on auto. Uh, firstly, on the deal uh, ramp up uh, last quarter, we had roughly two percent growth. Uh, we would have expected that uh, the, uh, with the with the deal that we have, we had one in Q2. They would have uh, contributed in Q4, and uh, so so with this 1.2 percent growth include those those ramp ups, or uh, this 1.2 percent has come without without that because we we're talking of the delays in the deals that we won in Q2 as well, right? So uh, how should we think about that match? So that uh, uh, you know we have ramped up a very small team, so the full ramp up has still not happened. So you can practically. Say that 1.2 percent doesn't include uh, any ramp up from that deal, so we are expecting that ramp up to happen. Uh, happen in the later half of Q1. Right, 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 right. So basically, the ramp up but has already started. Yeah, a very pretty small uh, ramp up has started. The whole, the actual deal is a is a multi million, multi year deal, but we have not been able to uh, ramp up to the initial you know expectations. Because of, because we had we had certain customer related issues, and we are hoping that that will uh, get over uh, uh, towards the end of this quarter. Okay, okay. And uh, what? How much has our OEM business grown uh, 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 as compared to FY23 in FY24? What was what was? If you can give me the number. The OEM business was about forty percent in the last financial year. Uh, this financial year, I mean, sorry. The FI 23 was 40 percent. FI 24 was 56 percent. Yeah. Okay, so this 56 percent is for the entire FI 24, not for Q4. Correct. No, no entire. Yeah, so Vimal, okay. maybe I can just add uh, the OEM business grew by about 40 percent year on year. Okay, so which implies that there is a significant decline in the tier one. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's correct. correct. That's correct. And we bottomed out there is what he's saying. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and uh, next question is for Gaurav. Maybe if you can help us understand the puts and takes for the margin margin of uh, uh, performance this quarter. Sure, Vimal. Uh, so margin came down by 100 basis point. Uh, 30 basis point came from the cross currency headwinds. Uh, while we continue to you know continue to invest and expand our talent base to you know to capture the capability and capacity building and also keep investing into the talent pool in terms of the you know ai capability so 80 basis point you know came from that uh, you know uh, cost towards those talent building and uh, people uh, got added during the quarter we also done with the last batch that we onboarded for 2023 campus in this quarter uh, that together 30 per, 30 basis point from exchange and 80 basis point from you know people rate investment capability building uh, you know give you total 110 basis point dip at the same time we have uh, some benefit from the cost of sales that we got op optimized that gives us a benefit of 10 basis points and hence the total EBIT uh, you know uh, drops from the quarter to quarter basis came at 100 basis point 
but if you see at the overall company level pnl if you see the cost has not significantly changed just you know in the quarter there was a certain headwind in one you know few of the verticals hence the revenue got a dip which has a you know impact on the margin but at the same time we see there enough level available capacity available to tap those you know levels available for us to you know get back to the you know the margins where we operated for the full year in fy24 and last clarification is the erstwhile idv business which we have now merged with the software business uh, that gets reported between media and comp and the other verticals right it, it does not, nothing gets added to auto no in fact it does it, it uh, all the three verticals it it that's all the three verticals uh, in fact you know what has happened is uh, uh, i mean just to explain uh, you know why we had to do this um, you know we have been uh, you know talking about our integrated you know design digital uh, you know offering and uh, taking a design led solutions to our customers so uh, we have been winning a number of integrated deals and depending on which uh, division was uh, really leading it the revenues were accruing to that particular division so in some cases you know idv used to get the revenues it is not only the design uh, revenues it also included the uh, the software revenues in some cases the transportation or the media and communication vertical they were getting the complete revenues so it was sort of little misleading in terms of how to segregate what is design and what is uh, you know the epd uh, offerings so and it was very, getting very difficult to go on a case to case basis and 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 uh, make this differentiation so we decided that look let us have an integrated uh, uh, you know um uh, epd plus idv offerings because it no longer made sense to really differentiate uh, uh, you know what is epd and what is idv and uh, and this uh, value proposition also resonated very well with our customers and uh, it only makes sense uh, when we look at it when we give a industry break up for all our revenues we we were only giving the epd revenues and that was sort of misleading because uh you know uh, you know 12 13% of our revenues which used to come from idv were not represented in this break up uh so uh, so to for apple to apple comparison with uh, you know if you want to compare peers or if you want to compare us with any other organization it made sense for us to give an uh, an integrated you know uh, uh, what is the total uh, you know market share from a uh, Uh, you know, out of all the revenues that we are generating, how much is for automotive, how much for for media and communication, and how much for healthcare? So that was the reasoning why we decided that look, it is it is better to give uh, a, a full view to the to the investors. Thank you so much. I'll fall back in the queue. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Manik Paneja from Axis Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I hope I. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Manoj, basically, just wanted to get your thoughts on two three aspects. Uh, the number one thing was that we've seen some of your traditional IT services companies acquire ER and D ER and D companies with deep customer relationships in some of the large OEMs. So, how do you think think that coupled with the fact that as customer spending moves towards uh towards middleware aspect how do how does those two aspects impact competition for pure play ear and d companies like ours that's question number one the second question was with regards to uh to just understanding your prospects in terms of fy25 in terms of growth across different industry segments like this year growth was led by automotive in a very significant manner while we had some challenges on the media side while healthcare started to pick up towards the later part of the year so how should we be thinking about uh, the growth dynamics across the three industry segments going into fy25 thank you sure. so um so i think uh, 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 yeah it is a fact uh, that uh, you know we have uh, seen uh, large it services companies uh, uh, trying to get into the er and d space especially the automotive space by Uh, you know acquisitions and that uh, that is a challenge that uh, you know we need to face uh, um I, i don't have a, a specific view on it uh, we would treat it as uh, you know any other competition uh, and uh, but however we are pretty confident on our 
you know um, design digital offerings uh, you know that that we have um and we have built the capability uh, organically over you know many years right uh, almost 30 years we have been in this business so we clearly know uh, you know what ticks in this industry uh, we have uh, built the processes that we need to deliver value on a sustained basis to our customers and many of the relationships that we have with our customers are you know more than 10 years 15 years 20 years sort of relationships that we have so um so so yes uh, we are looking at uh, some of the you know news that we read in terms of acquisitions and so on um uh, and we will take it on a on a case to case basis uh, from our side we are deeply uh, you know uh, focused on our existing customer base we are really uh, deeply focused on building our executive connect and deepening our relationship with our existing customers and ensure that we grow with those customers uh, so coming to uh, fi25 uh, growth uh, you know we, we don't give usually give our uh, our guidance uh, but uh, but i believe that you know, I'm, i'm very happy with the sort of growth that we have seen in uh, the automotive industry uh, uh, in the last financial year and, I, and 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 the push for us is to really uh, you know repeat that sort of a performance at the same time to really see how we can what i mean i talked about bottoming out of the mcv business we are really hoping that mcv business will uh, start you know um, uh, you know uh, uh, contributing to the growth of the organization uh, i'm pretty excited with the hsls business uh, you know that we've had a issue with mdr and and, and as a result of which our growth rates uh, slowed down uh, in the last financial year i think we have put all of that behind us and we really hope that we will be able to accelerate that uh, in the financial year so um overall i i i i strongly believe that uh, uh, we should be able to put up a better performance from a growth perspective as compared to last financial year okay just to yes sir please it will go add a little bit from my side and as a nitan here especially because i'm a little closer to some of these uh, mnas that we see and read about uh, my comment would be as follows right i think one we are in the right space in terms of the industries that we work in the fact that we have a presence in automotive healthcare and so on i think these are the these are the segments that are growing two i think we have always been in the right service lines very very important software and electronics is where all the growth is and i think we are absolutely in the right place for where growth is going to be three i think we are winning the right deals if you look at the pivot that we have made over the last few quarters i think you are seeing not just the significant growth that we are driving from oems but from the right kind of deals including sdb and lastly i think we are in the right country because your scale your capacity your ability to deliver will all come from india in my view i think some of the acquisition they were seeing as they endorsing the fact that we have the right ingredients and the right uh, ticks in the right boxes and many of the acquisitions are just an attempt to get into the same space with possibly companies that have relationships legacy capabilities and now they have a lot of lift and shift to do mm-hmm. that's why i would sure. it. if i can prod you on one more question so like you mentioned that we certainly expect fi25 to be better for potentially bottoming out of media and, and communications vertical and while transportation expected to do well given some of these ramp up challenges on the transportation side in the near term should one probably be expecting this growth improvement to be more back ended with possibly near term being as subdued as what we've seen uh, in the more recent past um yeah we we will grow out of it right i mean i mean we've uh, we've had a, a, a issue in our uh, media and communication business in the quarter we definitely will grow out of it in the in, in the quarter similarly uh, from uh, the transportation business also if you look at it we will grow out of uh, you know where we where we exited uh, you know last last quarter right so in my perspective we definitely will uh, do you know better including in q1 and that uh, momentum will carry forward through the financial year Sure. Thank you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Apurva Prasad from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Manoj, I wanted your thoughts on uh, uh, how should we look at uh, a trade-off between growth and margins. Um, so what i'm trying to get that is uh, would you rather 
SB Oak with growth at the current levels and a 30% margins, which is what you have maintained in the past? Or do you think uh, there is a case, a business case for uh, reinvesting some of these higher margins uh, to change better growth? Uh, so uh, the mandate from our, our board is very clear, uh, Apurva, uh, and I've uh, maintained this uh, repeatedly, right? So uh, we can't uh, we can't chase growth at uh, the cost of margins. Um, so we definitely need to maintain our margins as well as look at, uh, you know, growing uh, um, at, at a faster rate, right? So the focus for, from our point of view, from management point of view, and the strategies that we have in the organization, uh, the sort of investments that we are making is all towards, you know, accelerated growth without reduction in margins. Yeah, Got it. Yeah, I think what we're also saying is that we have enough levers with, to to make sure that we can support the strong growth that we want and we are looking to without sacrificing margins. So I think the point we're making is that the kind of net uh, hiring that we've done over the last 8 to 12 quarters, in fact, you had to step back to look at the fact that we have absolutely been consistently hiring in large numbers all through the last 8 to 12 quarters. Not all of it consumed for sure. So we've been building capacity. So to that extent, I think there is uh, there is enough levers. All right. And and, and uh, to the earlier point that you were making, uh, uh, which are the sub-segments uh, that could be doing much better? Uh, so you mentioned, I think, OEMs, which grew 40% for the year. Uh, so would you expect a similar run rate on the OEM? Uh, sub-segment, and, and which would be some of the other pieces within the business that you expect to grow faster? Yeah, we won't comment on the uh, the growth rates, but definitely what we can call out is to say that we expect the OEM part of the business to continue to grow strongly, partly because of the fact that we already won deals and have a path to ramping up. The other is we continue to focus on more, right? So to that extent, I would definitely call out that piece as one of superior growth uh, overall, and nothing to do with last year. So I'm not doing a comparison. The second is in the media and communication industry, I think we still have uh, a lot of faith in the relationships and the capabilities that we bring to operators. So we definitely see stress in suppliers and device vendors and so on, uh, just as much as we've seen the same in the tier on suppliers in the automotive industry. I think the operator pivot that we've made I mean, the continued uh, growth that we see there because of the relevant services, not because they have a lot more to spend, not because they are increasing budget, simply because they are more relevant. I think that will be the other piece. In media, I'm sorry, in uh, healthcare, uh, in general, I think we are in the right place. So we are winning the right logos in terms of device uh, vendors and the whole uh, uh, medical industry. But I think digital therapeutics and connected health. I think are two interesting areas that I think we will also see some of accelerated growth, obviously on a very small base because industry itself is just about picking an that up now. Uh, thanks for that, Nitin. Just finally, uh, uh, you referred to the the three percent Q1 Q impact from from the dip in media operator. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to reconcile this with a very strong uh, growth in top ten. So would this be outside top 10, or is there change in the top 10 classification? No, this uh, particular customer is outside the top 10. Got it. Got it. Thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Bharat Seth from Quest Investment. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, Rakhwan and Nitin. Thanks for the opportunity. Raghavan, in your opening remarks, you talk about the transformation on the customer side, particularly on transport, uh, transportation segment and media on the working directly with operator. And so can you give a little more deep insight into what exactly an OEM has grown, I mean, much better. So how it will play out in coming quarters or coming years for, from that perspective and is there any kind of a leverage that we can have in EBITDA also directly dealing with uh, OEM vis-a-vis -vis middleware people? Sure. So I will uh, maybe uh, request Nitin to uh, take that question. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Shade. Uh, 
quick one. Uh, if you look at what we are saying, essentially we're saying that in two industries, the value is now accruing to the top of the value chain because typically OEMs sit at the top of the value chain in the automotive industry. Sure, but sure. traditionally, R&D, product engineering, delivery of systems and software has been done by suppliers who then work with the OEMs against their specifications. OEMs right. traditionally have taken the role of saying, look, we are integrators, we are assemblers, and we are going to run the brand and the service for customers. Product right. and technology will come from our suppliers. And I think that is changing, and that is now accruing to the OEMs who are saying, look, there is economies of scale, there is greater innovation agility, we bring back the software to us, and we can also optimize on the hardware architectures and so on, which are all evolving. Where instead of having 50 boxes that do different things in a car, I can maybe have just one or two large computers which now run all the software with enough safety, okay. redundancy, and so on. So the swing of software development to OEMs, it's not going to be 100%, but there is more and more spend that is happening from OEMs at this time and will happen for the next few years simply because of this appropriation of software and development and value from the suppliers. And that is a trend that we are now following and reflecting in our results. And we expect this will continue for a period of time. The same is happening with operators, where operators traditionally have taken equipment from typically the likes of Cisco, Ericsson, Nokia, and so on. I think there is a strong move to open source software, to software that runs in the core. You, you dumb down and make uh, hardware more commoditized at the edge and so on and so forth. And I think that is exactly the trend that we are tracking in terms of who do we work with? Do we work with suppliers or do we work with operators? In addition, I think OTT was a completely different one where that opened up additional opportunities to work with customers we never worked with before, like broadcasters, content studios, and so on. Otherwise, we had nothing to do for them. We suddenly found that we could actually help them go direct to consumer with OTT platforms and so on. So I think that is the trend that we are following. So I think both are consistent uh, long-term trends for these two industries. And I think that is what we are really tracking and reporting. Now, this does not have a direct bearing on EBITDA. Okay. To extent, EBITDA is still a function of where do you deliver from, what services do you deliver, and the quality of your delivery. I think that is where we excel in general. And that is why our margins are superior, not because of the kind of customers we work with, but because of the work we do. So that continues. It's just that the who you do it for is changing, right? In fact, sometimes larger deals can also mean that you may have to give a little more in terms of uh, uh, the pricing that you uh, offer. But uh, we are confident that we will, we will have enough levers to manage margins while we pursue growth. You Sorry, think, wrong answer, but I thought it's important. No, no, it's fair, fair. I understand it uh, and sincerely appreciate. But is that, I mean, uh, that our debt continues of, I mean, uh, getting continue Earlier, we were doing short-term project and short, small size. So now the project size is increasing substantially and kind of a continuity. It is a little longer vis-a-vis -vis what earlier we had in both those places. That's correct. So I think, uh, uh, and in fact, I would say that this is a trend that uh, we have been both reporting and sharing with, uh, with analysts and investors at large that we are slowly seeing the shift of product R&D and ER&D to more strategic and less discretionary and less project-based, partly because there are life cycles of the product, especially with software, where you're going into continuous mode of improvement and updates. So it doesn't stop with the launch of the product into the market. It continues post the launch, and updates happen through the air, updates happen over cable, over connected. So I think that is a trend that we're seeing in product engineering itself. Okay, and last question on healthcare, which we are not. So, what are the changes, underlying changes that we are seeing that can, I mean, uh, we can have a sustainable longer term growth. Earlier on small basis, we were growing at very rapid pace, but there is now the pace has come, I mean, become negative. So, when do we expect those kind of pace again coming back on a little larger base? So I think on the uh, healthcare side, you have to remember that about three quarters back, four quarters back, we had uh, one uh, impact of a particular regulation, medical device regulation, for which we were at that time doing a lot of work that uh, was suddenly extended and relaxed, which allowed customers to pull the plug on what they were doing with us. And we had an actual significant hole in our revenue streams 
in a single quarter. I think the business unit has done very, very well to plug that, grow and show results despite that big hole in revenue that we saw on a very, very short-term basis. Right? So I think you have to reflect the growth of the BU in the context of the hole that we were in rather than as year-on-year, year, it was so much growth previous year and now what is your growth now? Part two, I think we've added some very, very good customers over the years. So I think the journey continues. I think we're in the right place. The media, sorry, the medical and healthcare industry, obviously because of the criticality, the nature of that industry, the regulatory environments is much, much slower to change. I think they are in a place where they have to change. And I think we are in the right place. And can I go for one more, if, if your permission? Yes, please. Uh, Raghavan, we have uh, integrated our designing with the uh, relative uh, segment. So, do we see anywhere, I mean, uh, with design uh, related in a manufacturing opportunity in the future? Um, uh, we, uh, if you're asking about manufacturing, if Star Alexi is going to manufacture products and so on, or getting manufactured third party and uh, with our design and the whole uh, software uh, built in. So, so for, you know, t typically what we have been doing is we have been building, uh, you know, we have been working with our customers, helping them, uh, try, uh, you know, uh, helping them in their design as well as uh, then they take it to the factory to enable that uh, the products to be manufactured, uh, you know, effectively. So that is something that we have been doing. We <laughs> have been building, for example, uh, samples for our customers, right? 50 units, 100 units, and so on. We are not gone into mass manufacturing, uh, you know, so far. Um, but however, uh, from a manufacturing uh, perspective, uh, it is also uh, in, in, it's also an interesting opportunity for us because manufacturing in India uh, will definitely continue to grow. So we have services from an IoT perspective and industry 4.0 perspective that we are incubating and we are building. And we believe that the manufacturing sector itself could also be a new opportunity area for us uh, that we are incubating at this point in time. However, if your question is about will we get into manufacturing of the products uh, for customers and so on, uh, we may partner, but I don't think we will uh, go and manufacture ourselves. Okay, thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avik Mehta from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just one question on India Telecom. Uh, I think you said that like bottom lot of nation starts seeing growth from year on. So what has changed, you know, uh, over the last three months, which gives you that confidence and secondly, within MediaCom, if you can throw some color on, you know, what are the sub verticals where you uh, are more optimistic from a demand rate from the perspective? Thank you. with uh, uh, key customers and prospects. We sort of have a better visibility on the spend uh, uh, from a customer uh, perspective, especially the key customers, the top customers that we have in that business unit. Uh, we continue to grow strongly with uh, uh, those customers. Um, as I've also said, they've made some changes in the way that business unit is structured. Um, we've brought in certain a new leadership we have restructured the sales organization also. So there's a, a, a focused, I would say, um, a, you know, campaign that uh, that we have run in in the last quarter, and uh, we are definitely hopeful of seeing those results in the subsequent quarters. Okay, and uh, within MediaCom, like any color on whether it's the operator, it's primarily the operator. So I think as Nitin has mentioned earlier. Um, last year, uh, we've seen that uh, uh, we have moved from the devices and, you know, the product space to the operator space. So almost 70% of our revenues, you know, come from operators. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think that is, that is the way to move forward. And we will increasingly see a lot more of our revenues coming in from operators. Uh, operators are also thinking of, you know, digital, you know, the cloud, AI, Gen AI, and so on. So all the capabilities that they're building are, uh, you know, focused for the operator market. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
The next question is from Salil Desai from Marcellus Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Manoj. Uh, I just wanted to kind of reconfirm my understanding. This, uh, you know, the HDS reporting that you're now doing, is that just a reclassification or is that like an organizational change also that has happened in terms of uh, reporting structures or, uh, or you know, business heads and so on? Sorry, uh, at this point, of, uh, this point in time, Salil, it's a reclassification. Uh, we have not done a change in the structure internally to the organization. But however, we have put in certain, you know, processes uh, to define, you know, what is the, uh, uh, you know, um, the design revenues and how we will account them and so on from a individual business unit perspective and so on. Yeah, so maybe, Salil, I can just add a little more. Uh, yeah. This is the organic change that we have made over about eight quarters or so, because the intent was that, look, if you have to really be able to co-sell, if you have to be able to package, integrate offerings, and then take it to market, if you're able to be able to be very seamless in how we can start with design, but then take all the views that we get, the inputs that we get, the conversations and the executive connects that we have, and be able to translate it in downstream, then the integration has to happen at multiple levels. Okay, let me let me correct uh, myself. Uh, you know, when when we, when I answered that, right? We have integrated the sales organization. The selling happens seamlessly. Okay. <coughs> and yeah, but uh, the design plus digital is a organic inter integration that we've done over eight quarters. So in that in that sense, there are teams that are now fully aligned to each vertical. So you yeah. don't see it as two different business units now wanting to talk to each other. They're actually one team that are working with each other. I see. Okay. Okay. And the second bit I wanted to again reconfirm was, was uh, you mentioned somewhere that uh, you know, the hiring is in a way that you've done through the year is in a way an indication of uh, you know, kind of a hope for a better uh, uh, FI25. Uh, you know, these are what profiles you, know, you hired largely freshers, uh, experienced people, middle management. Has, could you give some color on uh, what profiles have you been generally hiring? Yeah, so it's typically been, uh, you know, a lot of the hiring, uh, you know, um, we uh, do from uh, the colleges and universities, right? Fresher hirings, almost about I mean, 70, 75 percent of the uh, hirings that we would have done uh, would be, uh, you know, uh, from campuses. Uh, of course, we do uh, take in laterals uh, as well, uh, uh, depending on the specific, you know, customer need and, and so on. Uh, but uh, when we plan for a bench and when we plan for building capabilities and skills, a lot of it is based on, uh, you know, pressures uh, that we, we would then, you know, train and keep them ready for uh, project engagement. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Karan Uppal from Philip Capital India. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I just have one uh, question for uh, Nitin, sir, uh, regarding the comment which you made on automotive business. So, so Nitin, sir, you mentioned about the shift of software development work from tier ones to OEMs. Now, uh, how much uh, of the work is being done in-house R&D in, in, uh, with, with OEMs versus outsourcing to vendors like us? That would be a tough one to answer. Why? Because I think uh, the journeys of different OEMs are different in the sense that if you look at uh, a couple of OEMs, they've all been about, we don't want to give it to anybody, everything will be done in our homeland and will be done by our nationality and so on. And I think they also turned around and said, look, that's not possible, not feasible, doesn't work, and it's too expensive. They have been significantly delayed in their own deliverables and their timelines. And they're now pivoted to saying, no, we need to work with vendors. We also need to work with organizations that understand how this is done because we are trying to uh, both uh, uh, learn and run an engine together, and that doesn't work. Uh, there are certain other organizations that have started with working with a very good small set of strategic vendors, and then also doing a captive in India or wherever else, right? And therefore running a dual view of what do I get done in my home, home country? How do I use my own captives for certain work that I think they're best for? And how do I use vendors uh, where they are best for? So I think there is no one single answer that I can tell you, and this is also evolving over time. Remember, this all this is just about two, three years old in many ways.
ओके थैंक थैंक यू Marginal changes. I don't think it is uh, very significant. Uh, 
not as if that suddenly we are going from uh, 20, uh, you know um, 25% uh, you know on site to 40% or 50% it's marginal plus or minus shift to 1% 1 or 2% so i, I think uh, yeah, uh, don't read much into it i think uh, there is no fundamental change in trend okay understood, understood. thanks for taking my question yes please thank you the next question is from rajesh choudhury from senate please go ahead yeah good evening uh, my question is, uh, do we have any opportunity or do we foresee any opportunity in the semiconductor testing? Because uh, India and Tata Group is making a lot of investments in the semiconductor industry. In India. Semiconductor industry is something that, uh, you know, we have been involved in, uh, you know, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, about uh, seven, eight years ago, we actually uh, exited the design space. Uh, but however, we continue to uh, you know, work with semiconductor customers in the software, you know, the embedded and the firmware uh, area. So uh, definitely we have capabilities, uh, especially relating to the vertical markets uh, that we address, right, whether it's automotive, whether it's media telecom or healthcare. Uh, we build, uh, you know, solutions uh, uh, on the on the chips uh, for these particular uh, industry verticals. So as far as, far as uh, uh, anything to do with uh, these three industry verticals, we have a play. But we, uh, at this point in time, uh, we really are not getting into the design, the chip design uh, uh, aspects uh, uh, at this point in time. Okay, so we would only be involved in the testing phase? Uh, or so the application development, uh, uh, you know, all of that. Application development, and but, but that would only be related to the software part and not to, the, to any of the hardware part. Yeah, not into the chip design space. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That was the last question at you. I would now like to hand the conference back to the management team for closing comments. Um, thank you, investors. It was a eventful, uh, you know, F524. Um, you know, a lot of changes happening in our market. But, uh, you know, I, I believe we as a team, uh, Team Alexians, uh, we have come out exceedingly well, uh, shown a strong growth of 13% uh, uh, year on year. We, and as, as stated, uh, when, I, when I stand here looking at uh, the new financial year, we really confident that, uh, you know, on, on the pipeline and the conversations that we're having with customers. And uh, we really, really hope for another strong performance this financial year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. On behalf of Tata Alexi, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. You may now disconnect your